Hey guys, well, we'll go for about an hour. On the... Hey guys, this is John uh, from waltonsinc.com and Meetgistics. And as you just heard, I was talking to Patrick. We will go for max of an hour today on this live stream. Uh, so this is the second one of these that we're doing. And I'm just gonna quickly keep an eye on chat. Let me know if we're having any audio problems. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with our other live streams, you'll know that that's not that uncommon of a thing. We often have some form of audio uh, issue, but I think we're getting on pretty smoothly here. Uh, so somebody in the chat, just let me know, make sure that, uh, that you can hear me. Um, what we're gonna be doing today is talking about additives. Now this is something that um, Tex77 came up with, he suggested it, and really think it can be a, a useful thing for everybody and started off the last live stream like this, and I'll probably start them all off like this for a while at least. This is a weekly Meetgistics live stream. This is gonna be focused almost exclusively at meat processing. We love doing our monthly live streams, but those very rarely have much to do with meat processing. We'll answer some questions, but in general, we kind of meander and go wherever. Uh, here, we just wanna do targeted information. Um, all right, cool. So we are broadcasting, audio sounds good. Um, so thank Tex for this topic. It is a great one. Um, we have started a thread over at meatgistics.com where you can post any ideas, any topics that you want covered. Um, I don't think we're always going to make it just one individual topic, um, but for something like additives where there are a lot of them and there are plenty of questions people have, plenty of things to talk about, uh, we probably should be able to fill an hour, which is the information I have, and then answering specific uh, questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gabriel Hart says, this isn't additive related, but sneak in an update on those new Walton's grinders at some point. We are hoping they will be here on Monday. Um, so we'll get hopefully another update tomorrow and then we will have a better idea. Should be no later than the end of next week. Uh, after this, we've got a, kind of a company event to do, but I will flip our products live on waltonsinc.com. Um, I'm not gonna make them orderable just quite yet, but I want you guys to get a look at the specs on those uh, and some descriptions. So sometime in the next 24 hours at waltonsinc.com, you will be able to look at a, a, it won't be exactly our grinder, but it is the model. It's a picture of it, um, as well as the specs for the 32, 22, 12, eight, and the little eight uh, kitchen home grinder as well, which is a surprisingly powerful little grinder. I was very impressed with that one as compared to say one of the, the Weston uh, home grinders. I thought it compared very favorably to that. All right, on to additives. So just anyone who has questions, put them in the chat and I will go back through occasionally, but I'm pretty much just gonna start talking and then just look at chat every once in a while. Um, so the, the first one we want to talk about, obviously, is Sure Cure. So your cure is an additive. Uh, cure is sodium nitrite, but it's not pure sodium nitrite. Uh, the reason for that is that sodium nitrite in the levels that we need would be very hard to measure out for small batches. So this is mostly just salt, just regular old salt, um, well, a certain flake of salt, and then it's got red dye in it so that there really aren't any chances for uh, a mix up there. There's not another meat processing additive that I'm aware of, at least that is that very unique shade of pink. Um, it is 6.2% sodium nitrite. So sodium nitrite breaks down into nitric oxide, which is actually what really gives the curing power in meat. It is responsible for so many things in a cured sausage. It's responsible for what we would call like a cured taste. Same thing in ham, um, same thing in bacon, all of that. Uh, it also helps fight off a whole host of nasty things. When we're smoking a sausage, a ham, anything like that, we're really 
just creating the perfect environment for lots of bad bugs, biomes, things like that. Um, e. coli being a really, really big one. So that helps fight that off and prevents the growth of it. Um, if it's still there, it might not all the time kill it, but will prevent its growth, which is what we're worried about. We used this on Meatistics the other day, but just like viral loads when you're sick, the amount you take in is important. Um, if you get a few strands of the a coronavirus or the cold, the flu, anything like that, you're probably gonna be okay. If somebody who's really sick sneezes right in your face, uh, that might be a, a different situation. Same thing applies when we're talking about food poisoning. If you get just a tiny little bit, you're probably gonna be fine. If you eat the whole steak, then you're probably gonna have an issue. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. There is also something else called celery juice powder. So if you've seen in the store, which everybody has at this point, something that says uh, no nitrites added or nitrites you know, available in nature, that is cured with celery juice powder. Now, celery juice powder isn't necessarily recognized by the USDA as being a cure, but it does recognize it as having curative properties. So you figure that out, what they're trying to say there. Um, the, the end goal from my point of view is that they're basically the same thing. They're doing the same process. Um, for people who are concerned with their nitrite intake, somebody who eats bacon once or twice a week, a couple of snack sticks, is going to have a lower nitrite level than somebody who eats a ton of root vegetables like celery. Um, there's more nitrites in that than there is in those cured sausages. Um, so nitrite is one part of the cure. There is also something called nitrate. So a cure that is going to uh, hold something for a long time, if you're doing a prosciutto, uh, actually prosciutto might be a little bit different of a, a, a way they do that. But if you're doing something where you're curing it and it's gonna be a long time, <clears throat> you would use a cure that has both nitrite and nitrate, sometimes cure num called cure number one and cure number two. Um, nitrate breaks down into nitrite, which then breaks down into nitric oxide. So you have the immediate power of the nitrite in a cure like that and the long-term powder in that nitrite or nitrate, which is breaking down into the nitrite. Um, now, you can speed up that conversion from nitrite to nitrate with something like cure accelerators. Now, there's a couple of different cure accelerators. The one that we deal with the most here is encapsulated citric acid. So this is encapsulated citric acid. Um, I often just shorten it to ECA, but it's encapsulated citric acid. Uh, when you look at it, it looks pretty similar to salt, um, but when you feel it, it's got an almost waxy texture to it. So that is the encapsulation, and that is a cotton or palm seed oil coating. It's around each little grain of the uh, citric acid, and that is designed to melt and pretty much disappear at 135 degrees. As long as it's been over 130 or 135 degrees for an hour, you shouldn't have any idea that there was any type of encapsulation in your product. Now, how this uh, actually speeds up the cure, the mechanism behind it, I went to a, a short course uh, cured, meat or, yeah, cured meat class up at Iowa State and cornered one of the professors after this because that was really like the main thing I wanted answered. And I was fairly shocked uh, by his answer. And it's not necessarily that it interacts with the nitrate or nitrite, what it does is it creates an acidic environment. So think of any single cell organism. Uh, it is eating by osmosis, right? So it's pulling things into it. An acidic environment doesn't allow it to do that. It makes it form up its defenses and spend its energy in preventing things from coming in. Hence, it can't grow. In that time, 
that then gives the nitrite enough time to work. Um, I was fairly shocked by that. I figured it would have been some chemical reaction uh, with the uh, sodium nitrite, but it turns out it's kind of like a one-two punch there. Now, we love the encapsulated citric acid, but there are a couple things with it. One, it has to be added during the last 60 seconds of your mix, and it really should only be used with a ground-informed product like uh, summer sausage, snack stick, cured sausage, or you can even use it in a ground-informed jerky. But if you try to add it too early, you run the risk of rupturing enough of that encapsulation. Some is going to get ruptured no matter what you do. But if you rupture enough of it, you're going to release the acid too quickly into the process. And it's going to start denaturing your proteins. So if you've added this and you're mixing, 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 and can't get protein extraction, that's because the acid has probably denatured your proteins and you're not gonna get a bind pretty much no matter what you do, as far as I'm aware. You may at that point have some luck uh, with something like super bind, but in general, I would say at that point, you've got some ground beef or deer or whatever you've done to, to cook up in a pan because it's just not gonna hold together. The other thing is, as we mentioned, this is an acid, so it drops the pH fairly significantly. I mean, it's not a huge drop, but it is a drop. So this is responsible for a lot of that tang that you get in cured sausage, like snack sticks, summer sausage. There are some areas of the country where they're not gonna consider it summer sausage unless it's got a pH of you know 5.2 or something around that. Uh, they really, really like that tang. I really enjoy it, um, but we definitely have people here and we've got Meatistics users who don't care for it. So if you don't care for it, there are some other cure accelerators you can use that aren't going to give you that tang. Uh, and the big one is sodium erythorbate. So what is sodium erythorbate? It is really, until recently, a additive that we really only recommended for commercial customers. And that is because it is very, very potent. Um, I've told this story numerous times, but I think it's worth just repeating again. I was making a cured sausage product that wasn't paying any attention to what I was doing. I was making a 20 something pound batch, not quite full of 25. Uh, and I put in my sodium erythorbate and I was mixing, 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 mixing. Uh, and then somebody happened to walk by who knows and certainly at that point knew a lot more about meat processing than I did. And as I was mixing, it was, oh, your sodium erythorbate all got caught in one place down there. And I was like, oh, no, I put way more than that in. And he looked at me and I kind of thought it over. Like he looked at me like, uh, what? So I'd put a whole pound into a 20 something pound batch of sodium erythorbate. That's multiple hundreds of times more than you're supposed to use. Would it have killed anyone? Maybe, probably not. Um, but it does bear repeating that sodium erythorbate is something you have to be very careful with. It's seven eighths of an ounce is enough to do 100 pounds of meat. So that breaks out or down to one quarter, 0.25 of a gram per pound of meat. Um, be very careful with it. The I brought this up earlier. Where is it? I have, uh, no, oh, no, I must have closed it. Uh, the, the precision scale from Escali, um, precision or measures in the fractions of a gram up to 500 grams. So if you have a scale that's capable of doing that, you can use sodium erythorbate and it imparts a very slight tang nowhere near as strong as the encapsulated citric acid. Um, another one that you can use is a smoked meat stabilizer. Uh, smoked meat stabilizer, you use two ounces per pound of meat. And I'm sorry, I should have said, encapsulated citric acid, they say to use three to four ounces per 25 pounds, but I, I recommend you just use four. It's gonna help a little bit with shelf stability and it's gonna give more of that tang. And it's just gonna make sure that your cure was accelerated. Um, the smoked meat stabilizer is two ounces per 25 pounds of meat, and that is a mix of two different acids. It's a, a sorbic and citric or something like that. <clears throat> it does not impart as much of a flavor 
uh, tang-wise as the encapsulated citric acid does, but it definitely does some. The big thing with the smoked meat stabilizer is it cannot be used in brines or pickles. If you add that to water, it is gonna gas out immediately, and that can actually be dangerous. Now, if you're mixing it in with meat and water, that should be fine. We just don't wanna mix it to standing water. That's when we're gonna run into problems, and that's the smoked meat stabilizer. Um, and then the other one is uh, something that, this is really just commercially available. It's not something that we would break out into smaller packages <clears throat> to sell to uh, just the home retail guy. It's Cure Accelerator, and Accelerator is spelled like Excel, uh, like the uh, program on Windows. Um, and two ounces of that works for 100 pounds of meat, and it works faster than sodium erythorbate or other cure accelerators, but that really is something that should just be used by experienced commercial processors. Um, now, the other thing we always talk about on Meatgistics is binders. Give me one second. So, there are two binders that probably get talked about more than anything else, and that is carrot fiber and sure gel. So sure gel is what I recommend you use if you're doing a cured product, like a snack stick, summer sausage, uh, anything like that. The reason being is that sure gel actually has protein. So it's adding protein to your mixture and it's making protein extraction easier. When you're doing a cured sausage, protein extraction is really important. It's what keeps everything together during the long smoking process. So if you try to just mix minimally uh, your snack stick, whatever, stuff them into casings and hang them over snack sticks, when you're gonna come in at the end of your smoke cycle, you're gonna have fat all over the floor and you're gonna have real dry, wrinkled products. This is because the fat's gonna render out of the meat and it's gonna start doing that around 130, 140 degrees. Um, it is then going to get pushed to the outside of the meat. It's going to get either caught between the meat and the casing, or it's just going to drip straight down and create a huge mess. So sure gel allows the fat, the water, the meat, the, all the other additives, the seasoning, to all bind together better. Uh, we've done numerous videos where we show protein extraction, but basically as you're mixing, you should be able to reach down, grab a hunk of it, and pull it apart with your hands and it should stretch. It should, you know, like a accordion. Um, if it just breaks into two, continue mixing. Another good way to tell is reach down, grab a handful of it, hold your hand out like this. If it sticks up in your palm and in your fingers, you're probably good. If it just falls down, you gotta keep mixing. Um, unfortunately, with most home mixers, it's very hard to get protein extraction without having some sort of fat smear. Uh, so while protein extraction does have a specific look to it, and you can kind of look at something like, okay, that looks like protein extraction. If you're using a paddle mixer, uh, you will get protein extraction, but retain your, uh, some of your particle definition. You might get nice, you know, big pieces of fat, um, that you're just not gonna get with most paddle or even hand systems. Uh, now, your small KitchenAid mixer, it's probably not gonna do any better than the paddle systems, and uh, you can only put a couple of pounds of meat in there at a time. So, definitely recommend SureGel for any cured sausage. Carrot fiber is absolutely great for fresh sausages, bratwurst, Italian, anything like that. The reason we like this in fresh but don't like it in cure is that its main job is as a moisture retention agent. So carrot fiber holds 26 times its weight in water, which does mean I can take one ounce of carrot fiber, 26 or 25 ounces of water, mix it in, and that carrot fiber is gonna hold it. It's gonna turn into like a, a sludge kinda. Uh, there won't be any standing water in there. So while that's awesome for keeping moisture and giving us a juicier bratwurst, uh, you know, any other type of sausage that we're not curing, 
it does sort of work against us when we're talking about a cured sausage because a summer sausage, a snack stick, those are a semi-dried product. So this is trying to hold on to all the water in there while we're trying to cook some of it out. So if you use that, you can run into vastly increased smoke times, or you can have a, a little bit of an off texture up there. Um, Supermind is another one. Uh, now Supermind is a mix of carrot fiber and potato starch. So you get the benefits of the carrot fiber, but potato starch actually forms a gel right around 130 degrees, which is the same temperature that your meat is gonna start expelling its water at. So as the meat is pushing it out, that is forming a gel and uh, absorbing it. So can definitely be used in cured sausage, is excellent for use specifically with chicken sausage. Does a great job just holding all that water in there. So just something to, to think about. Um, some of the other ones are soy protein blend, uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'll run through that real quick. Sure gel, you use six ounces to a 25 pound batch. Carrot fiber, I think it's like 3.79, just four ounces to a 25 pound batch. Superbind is seven ounces to 25 pound batch. There's another one, a soy protein blend, which can be used in cured sausage mostly. Uh, if you ever look at it, it kind of looks like breakfast cereal, surprisingly. Uh, you use 12 ounces of that. Now, the nice thing about soy protein blend is it also adds protein. So it does make protein extraction easier. Uh, while it looks like breakfast cereal or breakfast porridge, um, it is not gonna look like that in your finished product. It pretty much just all dissolves away. Um, so yeah, that is a, a good low cost uh, binder. Not as good as sure gel though. Uh, then we have uh, a W better meat binder, which is a wheat based binder. Now, this is something you'd use at a rate of 3% of your product's weight. So if you were doing 100 pounds of sausage, you would use three pounds of this W better meat binder. Um, that I think we only sell in 50 pound bags and we only sell that to certain commercial customers. Uh, the dairy blend, which is, again is a 50 pounder. Um, so this is gonna be like closest to that non-fat dry milk that a lot of home recipes call for. Um, now it's also gonna be 3% or three pounds to uh, 100 pounds of sausage. So it's a, a high quality meat binder made from dairy that can be used in sausage, snack sticks, or other meat snacks to help with meat binding process and prevent your product from fatting out during the smoking process. Um, so yeah, it, it, sorry, it's a 25 pound box, not a 50 pound box. All right, I'm gonna quickly shop on over to, to chat and see if there are any questions there. Uh, Scotty's asking where Austin is. I assume that's what he means by the little guy. Um, we've got Austin working feverishly on other things right now. Uh, he will be back when we're over this little bit of craziness. Um, but yeah, we've got him focused on certain things. And these live streams, um, the weekly Meatistics live streams will probably be more my thing. Uh, Austin will certainly jump in from time to time, but uh, he will still be here during the, the monthly ones. Let's see. All right, does sausage with smoked meat stabilizer need to be cooked immediately like ECA? So no, but then there's, if you're not gonna do that, there's not really much reason to add the smoked meat stabilizer. Um, so if you're not gonna cook it right away, I just wouldn't add any type of cure accelerator to it. Um, Ryan says those precision scales are awesome. Yep, uh, I agree with that for sure. Uh, Lynn says, do you mix sure gel with water before putting it into the meat? So I don't. Um, I add all of my additives, if, uh, other than ECA if I'm adding that, uh, including my sure gel, to the meat, and then I pour the water over top as I begin to mix. Uh, you could do that. The problem with a binder and doing that is you're gonna start to form glues that are a paste you're gonna to start to form a paste and that might not mix in it with the rest of the meat as well so i just like pouring everything in starting to mix it and adding water as i'm going i find that to be uh, the most effective way 
Uh, LaRue says, say no to soy. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you there, even though it's phytoestrogens, not actually estrogens, but I, I, I just don't trust it. Um, James Hoover says, did the new grinder come in? Uh, when are they going to post it on the website? So we covered this quickly at the beginning. Uh, they were hoping that they will be here Monday. If they're not here Monday, we should definitely have them by the end of next week. Um, I'm going to go ahead and flip them live on waltonsinc.com in the next few hours here. Um, they're not going to be purchasable yet, uh, but they will be up there so you guys can see a basic picture of what they look like. Uh, they won't be exact, but it'll be very, very close, just minus some branding. And uh, you'll be able to look at the features, uh, what, how many ground, or, uh, pounds of meat they can all grind. Uh, so yeah, so that should be later in today. Uh, Gabriel says, you usually put your sure cure in with water for mixing, right? Uh, I often, often do. Uh, it, it's such a small amount, and especially when I'm making a smaller batch, you just have to do so much mixing to make sure that small amount of cure makes it to all the meat. Whereas if you put it in with the water, much easier to tell that it's gotten everywhere. So that's not something I've always done or that I always remember to do, but it is something I, I like to do uh, when I can. All right, back to... Yep. All right, so uh, for this category there might not be a lot that you guys are familiar with other than one or two of them um, and it is flavor enhancers and it takes up a surprisingly large portion of our additives page so the one you guys are probably all familiar with is msg msg stands for monosodium glutamate um, i've written a couple of things on meat Justics about this um, I'm an enormous fan of MSG. So MSG is going to increase the umami flavor of pretty much anything it's in, but it is also just used as a basic flavor enhancer. It's been said that it can take and boost the flavor of pretty much anything you add it to. Now, being in New York, I think it was like in the 90s, there was this huge push against MSG. People are saying it's a chemical, it's bad for you. MSG can be created a couple of different ways, but I believe the most common is still mushrooms. Um, so it's not like it's, it's some chemical whipped up in a lab. And I just, I like it and I don't have a negative reaction to it. Now, some people do. Some people will have something with MSG and get terrible splitting headaches. I mean, it definitely does happen. But I feel like this is kind of one of those gluten things. Where everyone's like, oh no, I'm gluten intolerant too because I ate a pizza and then I felt fat. Like, yeah, you ate a whole pizza. Of course you're gonna get bloated. I mean, we're not supposed to eat that much. I'm not saying I don't, I definitely do. But, uh, so MSG in general, I don't think people need to be afraid of, but we've gone so far down that road that almost all of Walton's uh, and Excalibur's products will have no MSG in it. If it does have MSG, it'll be listed in the title like uh, we have a, a few different versions of Willys. Um, one of them does have MSG and that one says MSG in the title. It will also have to be listed as an ingredient. So if you go uh, to any product on waltonsinc.com, any seasoning product, if you scroll down the page, you'll see some additional information. And there are a couple of tabs right there. One of those is additional info and you can click on that and it will give you uh, a list of the ingredients. Now those are proprietary ingredients from Excalibur, so sometimes it'll just say things like spices, um, but if MSG is in there, it has to be listed there. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, another one is uh, California ham spice. So California ham spice is something that both home and retail users should add to their hams anytime they're doing them. If you try to do a ham with just the ham cure, it's gonna taste fairly bland, surprisingly. Um, the California ham spice really does give it a lot of the flavor. Um, for that, you're gonna use uh, six to eight ounces, just six to eight ounces to 10 gallons of water uh, for a 10 to 15% pump. So 
I mean, that's incredibly small amount. So six to eight ounces to 10 gallons for a 10 to 15% pump. And what we mean when we say 10 to 15% pump is if our product weighs 10 pounds before we pump it, we want it to weigh 11 pounds after if we're doing a 10% pump. So you're just adding 10% of its weight with whatever you're injecting into it. Uh, bacon Taste Booster, this is one of those where we have one that does not have MSG and one that does have MSG. Um, you use them at either, for the no MSG, it's six ounces to 100 pounds of meat, or, and this should show you how strong MSG can be, or you use it to eight ounces to 150 pounds of uh, meat. Now, Bacon Taste Booster does a couple of things obviously increases the bacon taste in the meat. Um, it is, it's salt and a couple of other things. Salt is the main ingredient there, but it also helps fight off rancidity in the cooler. If you've ever taken bacon out of your freezer and it's been in there for a long time and you've cooked it and you've gotten like almost a metallic taste to it, your bacon has started to go rancid and it can happen surprisingly quickly for bacon. Um, as little as six months and your bacon can start going rancid in the freezer. So adding bacon taste booster not only makes things taste more like bacon, but it also helps extend the shelf life. We used to recommend that people only use bacon taste booster when they were, it's described use I believe is adding old world flavors to modern curing techniques. So that means it's making it taste more like dry rubbed bacon when you're injecting and tumbling it. Um, we then one time tried it in uh, imitation bacon because somebody wanted to know, and that was amazing. Uh, so then we started adding to more things. I now use it when I'm making bacon flavored snack sticks. It makes those taste better. Uh, recently we did snack sticks that we added bacon. So we did the sweet maple bacon snack stick we added 10% or somewhere around there, eight to 10% of actual cooked bacon and the bacon taste booster and people freaked out for them here. Uh, I don't always love adding bacon to sausage products because it tends to get them a little soggy. And these definitely did that. They weren't, you know, if you held it, I basically want my snack stick to, you know, just stick straight out. These were kind of flopping over a little bit, but people thought the taste was well worth that. Um, and then we've got hickory smoke powder. So hickory smoke powder is to be used at one ounce to 25 pounds of meat, so pretty strong. Um, and this is gonna give you a smoked flavor of something smoked over hickory, huge surprise, uh, if you can't get it in a smoker. So if you're making snack sticks at home in your oven, and you wanna give it a smoked flavor, you can add hickory smoke powder. Same thing with summer sausage, with anything. Um, adding a little bit of this is a great way to get a pretty close to smoked, I mean, it, it's very close. Is it exact? No, but there's more to smoke than just the flavor. You're also getting you know, a different texture in a smoker than you're getting, gonna get in an oven. Um, so yeah. Uh, liquid smoke, this stuff is, not probably the liquid smoke you're buying at uh, the grocery store. This is three ounces to 100 pounds of meat, and this goes through an atomizer uh, in a smokehouse. So I think our big 500T will do it. I don't use it, but they have nozzles at the top, and you would send this through it and it atomizes it and sprays it on your product. So it's not burning anything to get that smoke flavor. It would be putting it in through a liquid smoke. Uh, and again, three ounces to 100 pounds of meat. Um, then we've got corn syrup solids, which is uh, seven or 0.75 to 1.5 pounds to 100 pounds of meat as a, a sweetener. Uh, Flavor XL, again, that one is an Excalibur. <clears throat> Anytime there's anything like XL, Excalibur likes to make it E X C E L. Um, that's, that's actually fairly clever. Uh, that is uh, four to six ounces for 100 pounds of meat. We only sell those in, in big batches. Uh, now dextrose is 10 ounces to 100 pounds of meat. Now dextrose is probably best known as a sweetener, um, but it is used really commonly as a way to, to kick off and feed starter cultures. 
Uh, my understanding is that it's easier for the lactic acid, everything, to eat the dextrose, like to process it, than it is for sugar. And given the choice between the two, apparently it always goes for the dextrose. So there's usually gonna be some sugar in the other seasonings, things like that. So you just add the dextrose so you know exactly how much it's gonna activate. So uh, when you're using something like the Bactoferm TSPX, a little bag that's I think like four ounces or something like that can do 400 pounds of meat. Uh, but if you're doing a 25 pound batch and you add half that bag, that's fine. You didn't add too much because only what is available, it's only gonna activate how much food there is available for it. Um, I hope that makes sense. I can't think of a better way to say that right now. Um, and then uh, the Flavor Excel is a combination of salt, MSG, spices, including celery and pepper. Uh, so that does have a lot of different things going on in it. Uh, but again, that's only available in 50 pound boxes. All right, I'm gonna pop back on over to chat to see if there are any other questions. Yeah. All right, so Tim says, my sister-in-law is allergic to MSG. Amazing how much sausage she has unknowingly eaten with no issues. <laughs> yep, yep, that is 100% a thing. Um, uh, Mark is asking about the MSG pound to, or uh, ratio, how much to use per pound of meat. I think that's gonna depend on the product you're making. Um, yeah, so it's in between two to five ounces per 100 pounds. I would say you would only wanna go up to the five ounces if it was something you were adding to a brine. Um, if you were adding it to like a jerky, definitely stay on the two ounce side. Don't go above that. Um, so one of the questions we get all the time, and I always like to address this when I can, um, is can I use X seasoning that's like for bratwurst can I use that to make snack sticks? <clears throat> and the answer is usually yes, especially if it's like a uh, cured to cured product. So like, can I use a summer sausage to make a snack stick? Absolutely. No conversion needed, no nothing, just go ahead. It might have a little bit different particle size, but that's fine. Can I use a snack stick to make bratwurst? Again, the answer is yes. Your salt content might be a little bit higher though, because there's more salt generally in a cured product, uh, the seasoning, than there would be in a fresh. That's because the salt is also playing functional roles beyond just taste. Um, so yes, you might wanna cut down the seasoning you're using by about 10% in the opposite way. Can I make, uh, can I take a bratwurst seasoning and can I make a snack stick with it? Yes, just use 10% more. And that 10% is just a range. You're going to have to try it, figure out what works best for each seasoning because different seasonings have different salt contents. Um, so yeah, you definitely can do that. The one thing we run into is even though they're both cured products, jerky and snack sticks or summer sausage can create a really big discrepancy. Uh, the example I always like to use, if you look at our jalapeno jerky and our jalapeno snack, seasoning, snack, sti snack stick seasoning, uh, the snack stick seasoning weighs just about twice what the jerky seasoning weighs. And that's because the jerky seasoning is designed to be a topical. So it's designed just to like rest on the top of it, not be ground and formed in. So you're going to get more of that taste when you bite into it. So if you tried to take a jalapeno jerky seasoning and make snack sticks with it, um, it would be a, a fairly bland stick in the exact opposite way. If you tried to take the jalapeno snack stick and made it, make it in jerky, it would be a very strong and salty product. So uh, the best thing I can tell you is when converting into and out of uh, jerkies, trial and error. It's just gonna be figuring out what works best with what. Sorry, I'm super thirsty. Ooh. All right, so we covered accelerators, flavor enhancers. All right, shelf life extenders. This first one is pretty important right about now. It is deer and wild game rinse. 
So, deer and wild game rinse uh, is used as a carcass spray. Basically, it's very inexpensive for any of you hunters out there. I really recommend you pick yourself up a bag of this, mix it up and bring it out with you. Spray the carcass, especially around the wound. Um, it is going to help you fight off the beginning growing of uh, you know nasty things in there. Uh, it is a mix of, uh, oh, I didn't write down what it was a mix of, um, but you mix uh, eight ounces per one gallon of water, dissolve well and spray, and I think it's uh, ascorbic and some other acid. Uh, so it is doing pretty much the same thing that we talk about with ECA. It's making it more difficult for uh, bad things to grow on it. Uh, just obviously molds, but that would be way down. Uh, e. coli, anything like that. It's making it more difficult for that to replicate. And we've said it plenty of times, but under ideal circumstances, a single cell of E. coli can become, I wanna say like 2.4 million within eight hours because um, they replicate every 20 minutes and you just get exponential growth. So, uh, very, very inexpensive. It's $3.49 for a bag and eight ounces makes a gallon of water. That gallon would last you, you know, the entire season. It's not like you need it in a huge amount on each wound. Uh, and then another shelf extender. Now, this isn't something you're gonna run into um, is Purisol. Now it's a mixture of food grade potassium lactate and sodium diacetate. And it's used in hams and pickles, uh, when we're doing bacons, when we're doing uh, uh, hams. Uh, it is designed to be added to water, not for a dry rub. Um, it acts as an antibacterial agent and it fights off lots of bacteria that is classically responsible for foodborne illnesses. So if you see Purisol as one of the ingredients in whatever you're eating, uh, there is nothing wrong with it. It is just a, a lactate and some sodium, uh, and it definitely does help preserve the food. Uh, fresh Bloom is another one. Now Fresh Bloom is specifically from Excalibur. Um, it's a mix of citric acid, ascorbic acid, those two, you here all the time in meat processing for so many things, citric and ascorbic. Um, and it's an erythorbic acid as well. Uh, and it fights microbes and E. coli. Um, it's used eight ounces to a gallon of tap water if you're using it as a spray. So this one can be used two different ways. When they're butchering, they're, I don't know if you guys have been into meat processing plants, but it really is fascinating. Uh, so they'll They'll hang the carcass, skin it, and if they're using a spray, they'll just actually walk around with a, a wand and spray it down to help it just sterilize it and prevent the growth of bad things. The other way this can be used is as a dip. And as a dip, it is used, um, I think a little bit stronger, three ounces to a gallon of water. And then they'll take subprimals. They won't take the whole carcass, but they'll take subprimals and dip it in there pull it out and that will uh, act the same as the carcass wash. Interestingly enough, it does have to be a cooled product when you're dipping it. Uh, it has to be already cooled down, chilled. You can't dip a hot product into that. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. So the last thing we're gonna cover today are moisture retainers. Uh, so carrot fiber can kind of live in two worlds it definitely does moisture retaining um, but we do leave it in the binders category because that's what far more people actually use it for um, but cold phosphate cold phosphate is a really interesting one and one that i've had a lot of experience with uh, when i first started working here and weighed 20 pounds less probably before i just started eating all these delicious foods every day uh, i was obsessed with trying to find a chicken sausage that would taste and have the same uh, palate experience as uh, a regular sausage. So I tried a bunch of different things, um, but I could never get chicken breasts to work out well. Like always, chicken thighs always tasted great. They have enough fat content, uh, 
really enjoyed those, but chicken breast was never working out well. So I started, first thing I added was uh, carrot fiber. So I had carrot fiber and more water, and it definitely did give me a, a better, juicier uh, chicken broth, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. So I was talking with our, um, uh, what is he, the application specialist, I think is the title that he uses when I talk to him about that type of stuff. Um, but he recommended I start playing around with cold phosphate. Cold phosphate raises the pH in the meat. So interesting eno interestingly enough, when it's raising the pH in the meat, it's actually changing its structure and making it easier for water to bind with the meat. So obviously it can hold more water. It will retain more water through the cooking process. So cold phosphate and carrot fiber when used in conjunction can make an absolutely great juicy chicken broth. It has a couple problems though. As you raise the pH of the meat, you're shortening its shelf life. And it can be pretty drastic depending on how quickly uh, you're, or how much you're raising the pH of the meat. You 100%, even if you cure it, uh, you want to treat anything with a raised pH from cold phosphate as a fresh product. You don't want to leave it in the refrigerator for a week. Um, it is going to grow some bad stuff. And you don't want to use it at more than its uh, recommended rate, which is two ounces per 25 pounds of meat, or it's going to start tasting like soap or chemicals. I, I always think more chemicals than soap. I recently did something where I injected a bunch of chicken breasts with different um, strengths of it at normal, tasted completely normal at two, two times, I think, two and a half times. I tasted more like chemicals at like three times or whatever was the next up I did. It just tasted like kind of like soap, more like chemicals. Um, and then sodium tripolyphosphate, which is really only going to be used in uh, commercial processing. And you're going to use it as uh, a pickle or you're going to use it in a pickle or directly to meat in eight ounces is enough to do 100 pounds of meat. All right. Let me shoot back on over to chats. Uh, Flyboy No More says, pink cure question. Does pink cure prevent E. coli and botulism? Is the correct temperature processing the only best way to kill potential E. coli contamination? So you, sure cure um, prevents the growth of E. coli and botulism but by itself, it's not going to kill it. Uh, when we're creating, or when we're smoking something, especially a sausage or a snack stick, we're really creating the perfect environment for those two, specifically those two E. coli and botulism to just explode. It's gonna be right in the danger zone most of the time. It's gonna be perfectly moist environment and it's gonna have lots to feed on. So the nitrate or nitrite breaking down into nitric oxide, and especially if you use a cure accelerator, is gonna keep your meat safe through that process. But yes, thermal processing, or if you're doing uh, a, a dry cured sausage, uh, there, that's a pH drop and you have to get to it in a certain time, um, those are the only two ways. And even then it does require some heat processing to be recognized by the USDA as being safe. <clears throat> I remember Z Sausage, ZX, Z Kid, I think a Polish kibasa that had a very slight acidic flavor to it was great. Could it have been vinegar and does vinegar help preserve? Um, so, yes, absolutely vinegar is sometimes used in sausage making. Uh, chorizo generally has a, a very strong vinegar flavor. The problem with adding vinegar will be that it's an acid, so it's gonna start denaturing your proteins and you won't get as good of a bind. That's why chorizo is often a crumbly product. Um, now dried chorizo, like uh, Spanish chorizo, is gonna taste a little bit more acidic, but any of those dry cured sausages are. So if your sausage that you're remembering as a kid was a Polish kielbasa, it wasn't dry cured. Um, I 
maybe there was just some vinegar powder in the the mixture they might have dipped it in vinegar um, i also like the taste of vinegar and really everything uh, one of my favorite shaker seasonings here is a sea salt and vinegar wing shake awesome on chicken even better on vegetables uh, especially cucumbers it is awesome on cucumbers correct cooking kills yep that's absolutely it all right guys i don't know if you can tell but i am absolutely exhausted uh it has been a long couple of weeks here as we're ramping up into busy season um and yep nope i'll stick around and answer a couple more questions though uh, is there an additive for fresh sausage to prolong the bloom to keep it nice and fresh looking before it turns south and looking brown there's bha and bht uh, we don't sell them um, those are antioxidants that will help fight that off. Uh, if you're doing this commercially, uh, you might call in and talk to your salesman about that. Um, but yeah, BHA and BHA or BHT, they're two really popular antioxidants. But I'll stick around for a few more minutes and see if anyone's got any other questions. If not, I enjoyed this. I like sitting here and getting to, to share some knowledge with you guys. Who knows how long it will go on. Um, eventually I'm going to run out of things to communicate to you. Uh, but as long as people keep showing up, we'll keep doing them. Uh, again, it's worth just repeating. We're not expecting the same viewership on these as we do get on our monthly live streams. I mean, those are more kind of a party. We're having fun, having a few beers, giving a few things away, talking to you guys. These are more just informational. So, all right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to shut down, and I will see you next week. Uh, same place, same time. Thank you. Oh, no.